So um, can you hear me? A bit better. All right. Welcome, everyone, to the talk about uh, lessons learned from the migration to Apache Airflow. Um, my name is Radek, and uh, I work as a chief architect at Schemelinks. So uh, at Schemelinks, we do um, commercial content monetization. I will explain a bit more about that. Uh, I also, in my free time, work as a trainer at uh, Framework Training, where we do some big data-related um, trainings. Uh, I used to work as a CTO at a couple of companies, including K4G, Data My Lab, and I was involved in many big data projects in the past uh, with such companies as uh, Orange, FCA, Kantar, OpenX, and many, many more. So agenda for this talk. As I will start from telling you a bit more about what is uh, that we do at Schemelinks, like how, what kind of data we process, how do we do it uh, with the Airflow, and why did we choose Airflow to process the data. Um, the part one will be focusing on the Airflow basic concept. So if you don't know anything about the Airflow yet, don't worry. Like I will give you some, some uh, basics. So we talk about the components, features, and I will show you some sample code. And then in the part two, I will focus on some of the best practices that we developed uh, over the last year back at Schemelinks. And we mentioned a few things about the deployment and what I like to call it the good, the bad, and, and the ugly. So Schemelinks data pipeline. So the longer version of what we do at Schemelinks is we monetize the product links in the commerce-related content to earn publishers a share of sales. So I like, to talk, I like to call it a better version of advertising because we don't actually show any display advertising on the websites. What we do is we give the publishers uh, like a snippet of JavaScript code. They drop it. Uh, they include it in the website, and that JavaScript code scans all the links to the external merchants, such as Amazon, eBay, and, and so on, and turns them into affiliated links. So if the end user clicks on any of those links and then buy the product, uh, we give the sh percentage share of that purchase to the publisher. Um, so essentially, it's, it's something which is completely invisible from the user point of view. Um, from the, I will give you some numbers. So we work with around 60,000 publishers uh, around the world, including um, over 50% of top 100 websites publishers in the US and UK. Um, we also work with almost 50,000 merchants around uh, the world, and we work with them through networks. So we don't do the tracking of the affiliate links uh, ourselves. We are, we are just like this extra layer on top of the networks. Last year, we processed over 80 billion page impressions and almost half a billion of clicks. Uh, and we drew a value of around 800 million of e-commerce transactions to all the publishers um, around the world, which translates into hundreds of terabytes of data. So pretty, pretty massive big data project from that point of view. What we do with this data is we process it, we aggregate it, and we present it as a customer reports to the publishers. Uh, we also do some data exports, so we aggregate the data and we send it to publishers and the customers into their, we, drop, we can drop it into Amazon S3 bucket or Google Cloud Storage, et cetera. And we also do some machine learning predictions. So why Airflow? So around a year ago, uh, we decided to do some big changes in Schemelinks. We used to use uh, Hadoop cluster, and we decided to uh, basically replace the Hadoop uh, with BigQuery, which is a managed SQL database. And we used to, for the scheduling, we used to use Uzi, Apache Uzi, and uh, we settled instead for the Airflow. Why Airflow? Well, Airflow is written entirely in Python. So what that means is Python, coincidentally, is a language of choice of a lot of data scientists. So if you are a data scientist and you want to implement some of the machine learning, you, know, you can do it directly inside the Airflow. Um, you can think about the Airflow as a cron on steroids. So it will help you to schedule your things uh, 
in like your batch processing. So let's say that you want to do some computations every one hour or every day. Uh, you can very easily do it with the Airflow. It's been a great productivity enhancer for us. So we calculated that during that last year when we migrated from Hadoop uh, to BigQuery and the Airflow, we managed to release roughly twice as many features thanks to Airflow as what we did before with the Uzi. Um, this is in large degree thanks to a lot of, of the features that Airflow gives us, namely modern user interface, which is something that you would never consider as productivity enhancer, but it helps you a lot because it basically, it scans the Python code in your jobs and it visualizes all the jobs that you implemented in that user interface that you can see on the right side. It shows you also which jobs are currently running, which jobs were finished. Uh, you, can, you have access to real-time logs of every job, every task in your job, so you can see if anything went wrong. Um, you have a, so it's not just only static view, but you can all actually drill in into any job or a task, and if something went wrong, with two clicks, you can retry any task very easily. And then on top of that, we have such features like data profiling. So let's say that um, you notice that your jobs are getting slower and slower and you don't really know why. You can just go into the section of the UI called data profiling and the data profiling is going to show you which part of the jobs are the slowest. So you can immediately see where you need to spend the effort to speed things up. On top of that, we have the command line. So if you, if you are the guy who doesn't really like the user interface, you can just run a lot of things directly from the command line. And then, last but not the least, this entire Airflow stack is horizontally scalable. So at Skimlinks, we run it uh, with the Kubernetes um, using so-called Seller Executor. I will come back a little bit to the subject later. Uh, what that means is that we can have multiple workers. You can have pretty much as many workers as, as you want to, uh, which will, in parallel, run all your computations. And so I already said it's written in Python. It's also code-first scheduler. What that means is that you define everything inside your Python code. So things like where that job should start, what is the start date, what is the, you know, how frequently that job should run, whether one hour, every one hour, or every one day. All of that goes into, into the code. And last but not the least, it has a great open source community. So chances are that whatever you are trying to do, you will probably find already some existing implementation uh, online inside the Airflow repository. So here is what we arrived at after one year of migration from the Hadoop to, to BigQuery. So this is roughly the, the architecture. So on the left side in here, we have the input data. So that's the, uh, the page impressions is the most heavy part where we have the terabytes of data. Um, so we basically push all the page impressions to the Google PubSub and then write them into the Google Cloud Storage and use Dataflow. Uh, Apache, open source version of that is Apache Beam. So we use the Apache Beam to read the data from the Google Cloud Storage and import it into the BigQuery. Um, and then the clicks are imported in our case in real time. So we have a system that reads them in small batches of few hundred clicks from the PubSub and inserts them in real time into, into the BigQuery. One, Important thing to note in here is that Airflow is going to help you with the batch processing, but not with the real-time processing. Uh, Airflow, by definition, is the scheduler that will schedule some job for you to run in predefined period of time, while with the real-time processing, you, you need a process that just keeps running in the background uh, all the time. So a part of this real-time processing uh, bit, everything else in here is orchestrated by Airflow. So we also import some data from the MySQL. So uh, customers' metadata, commissions data, things like that. All of that ends up in the, in the BigQuery, but you can very easily do it in any other SQL database. It's, we, we just opted for BigQuery because of the size of our data. Um, 
very important thing is also the monitoring. So you always want to make sure that you have a, um, like very good checks on the quality of the data. Uh, so whenever something goes wrong, we get the notifications on the Slack. We track all the like important time series in the InfluxDB and visualize them with the Grafana. And then on the right side, we export the data into three uh, things. So we have the in internal data warehouse, which is hosted in the MySQL. We also have the reporting for the end customer, which is actually done in the Elasticsearch. It works, surprisingly, works pretty well for us. And then we, as I mentioned earlier, we send some data to Google Cloud Storage and uh, Amazon S3. So a part of this pipeline that I just talked about, we also use the Apache Spark for some heavy machine learning processing. And in here, Airflow gives you really great flexibility when, when it com comes to running, well, really all your processing. There are always multiple ways to do the same thing. The same is true for Apache Spark. So we have three ways in which we can run the Apache Spark. Um, probably the best way would be to do it uh, using the PySpark module um, together with the Airflow's Python operator. So inside the Airflow Python operator, you can run any Python code you want to. And then you have the PySpark module where you implement your own like Spark computations that you want to do. And this way, Airflow will orchestrate the, the Spark from within the Python code. Another two alternatives is to use the Spark submit. So basically, you keep all your code inside the Apache Spark, and then you just submit the Spark jobs to Spark from Airflow using the Spark submit, which you can do very easily using the, well, there is a Spark submit operator for that. Or if you prefer, you can actually implement it yourself using the bash operator plus call the Spark submit from, from the bash operator. The reality, though, is that um, majority of the machine learning tasks are usually spent on data engineering. So um, things like cleaning input data, uh, ETL extraction, transformation, and loading, preparing your features, running the series of jobs, and then eventually productionizing the entire data pipeline, that's something that Airflow is really going to help you with. So it's not really going to help you much with the machine learning, which you implement yourself with Python, but the productionizing all the jobs uh, will help a lot with. All right. so before we go into the details on how the Airflow actually works, I wanted to ask you, does anyone here use already Airflow? Hands up. All right. Only one person, so it's good that we are covering some basics. So when you will be working with Airflow, you will hear the terms of DAX all the time. Um, so DAX stands for the Directed Acyclic Graph, and you will create, so your DAX is essentially your, your job, your workflow. Um, DAX is built from the tasks and the dependencies between the tasks. So the task is the uh, bit where you process some data, or you, for example, run the Apache Spark computation. And then you also specify the dependencies between the task, which tell Airflow what should, be, what should happen next once that task will finish. So for example, in here on the right side, we have a um, sample pipeline from Schemlinks where we first um, we process the clicks, uh, you can notice that comms pipeline and pages pipeline, which are all green, they don't have any dependencies, so they can all run in parallel. Um, for example, the link activity pipeline has a dependency on the clicks pipeline, which means that it can only start once the clicks pipeline will finish. Link revenue pipeline on the left, top, bottom left, I mean, those names doesn't really matter what, you know, it's just the name of the task. This task can only start once the com both comms pipeline and link activity pipeline will finish. You can, you can define much more complex uh, dependencies in the task. So you can have some branching operators, you can have joins, so, you know, like once both tasks finish, then the next one should finish, it should start. 
uh, branching where you can skip some tasks. So for example, you can have certain tasks that run over weekdays, but you want to skip them during the weekend and so on. So uh, it's, a, it's a very simple but very powerful concept. Examples of the DAGs and jobs. Um, you can, for example, create the report running by running some SQL query and then storing the results in the output file or the output table. Uh, you can extract the features for the machine learning pipeline or you can trigger the Apache Spark job. Then what is very exciting about this is that Airflow is going to parse your tasks and the dependencies between them, which you implemented in Python, and will do this visualization automatically for you. And this visualization is interactive. So you can click on any of those tasks, you can drill into them, and you can see the logs for this specific task, or you can rerun the, this task together with the, any dependencies. So let's say that if for whatever reason the page pi pipeline failed, which is on the right side, and we want to rerun it, if we select that we want to also rerun the dependencies, we are not, Airflow is going to automatically rerun for us the pages pipeline, the page activity pipeline, and all the dependencies below that as well. It's very useful because, you know, the problems in the, I mean, there are always problems that do happen from time to time in the production system, and you might want to fix such things. So operator uh, is, um, you, you can think about the operator as a class that defines what is going to be done inside your task. So we have a choice of operators that um, there are some building operators, there are country operators, or you can write your own custom operators. Um, example of the operator would be, for example, Postgres operator, which allows you to execute any SQL query of your choice against the Postgres database, or a bash operator where you can run any custom bash command uh, inside the bash. Then the task is an instance of the operator. So you can think, or it's an instance of an operator or, um, anyway, I will come back to it, um, or a sensor. So from that point of view, you can think about the task as an instance of the, of the class or an object. Uh, a task is a node in your DAG, and then, so when you, when you create the instance of, your, of the operator, you also have to provide the parameters for this operator. So for example, with the Postgres operator, your parameter would be SQL query that you want to run against the Postgres, plus the connection details that you want to execute um, against the database. Uh, we can also use very powerful Jinja templating system inside the Airflow. So um, it allows you, for example, with the bash operator, you can, you can put some parameters inside the uh, Jinja template and then just parameterize them by passing uh, variables inside, inside your task. On the right side, we have the um, example of the BigQuery operator. So we create the merge, um, uh, merge task, which is the instance of the BigQuery operator. We specify the name of this task, the SQL query that we want to run against the BigQuery um, database, uh, the connection ID, so like you, know, you might have a production database, staging database, and, and so on as well as um, some additional parameters. The interesting parameter in here I wanted to point out is the number of retries that you want Airflow to perform before succeeding the task. So, for example, um, if Airflow will be running this task for the first time and the task will fail for whatever reason, maybe because there was some problem with the connecting to the database, then Airflow is automatically going to retry that task again. You can, you can define how many retries you want. This is a very powerful feature because it allows Airflow to heal itself. So like very often what we find out is that we you know, go to the office in the morning, see some emails that there was some problem uh, with one of the pipeline, but actually everything went fine in the end because of the retries. So there, there are quite a lot of problems that just happen uh, randomly from time to time. 
some advanced features uh, that I'm not going to be covering in details in here, uh, but you can, you can use with the Airflow. Hooks uh, gives you the interface to external databases and platforms. So for example, there would be a MySQL hook, Postgres hook, BigQuery hook, and, and so on. Then the connections are stored in Airflow inside the Airflow metabase, and you can modify them using the Airflow user interface. Uh, so that's a very useful feature, because if you have two environments, let's say production and the staging environment, uh, you don't have to bake your connection inside your code. You can, you can just store it inside the Airflow UI, which will be then stored in, inside the Airflow database. Then we also have uh, variables. Uh, so you, uh, you can also define variables inside the Airflow metabase, which you can control through the Airflow user interface. Same story in here. You don't have to bake and hard code some, some of the variables inside your code, such as, let's say, um, you might want to use a different Amazon S3 path in production and different Amazon S3 path in your staging environment. You don't have to put it into your code. You can just uh, modify it directly from the Airflow user interface. XCOMS allows you to pass some parameters from one task to another task. So it's a mean of communication between the tasks. So let's say that one task, um, uh, one task can push some, some information to the next one, such as uh, I process the data for the last um, three days, and the ne next, next task needs to be aware of how many days it needs to process the data for. Sensors uh, allow you to schedule the tasks when certain criteria are true. So, as I mentioned earlier, you can, uh, Airflow allows you to schedule your batches. So you can, you can tell Airflow to run some kind of processing once a day, every day at 9 a.m. But you might add some extra criteria for it, such as, okay, run this at 9 a.m., but only if that specific file already exists in, the, in this specific folder. So for example, in HDFS, you might, you might want to wait for some external dependency to finish that Airflow doesn't have any control over. With the sensor, you can, you can basically check whether this, is, this criteria is already true or not, and then uh, you know, start execution of your task once, once that would be the case. And then there is a lot more uh, in the plugins. So, so uh, hooks, connections, uh, web views, template macros, and, and so on, they could be packaged into the plugin, and anything that should not be a part of the Airflow core usually goes into, into the plugins. There's a great repository uh, in the GitHub Airflow plugins where you can find some uh, very interesting um, implementations of such things like Google Analytics, for example. It's something that you know, you wouldn't want to have in the Airflow core, but a lot of people use it, and, and they might want to download the data from the Google Analytics, or some integrations with the payment platforms, such as Stripe and, and so on. So here is the um, sample code uh, that uh, shows how you would create a DAG inside your Airflow. So on the right side, we, we basically create a new DAG. We give it our name called Tutorial and we create three tasks. So we create the tasks T1, T2, and T3. All of them are instances of the bash operator. Um, and then uh, in this case, we just give it some IDs and then provide the commands that we want to run inside each of those bash operators. So the first task, we just run the command date. The second one will sleep for five seconds. And the third one will use the Jinja template that I mentioned earlier that is parameterized with, the, with our params in here. So in the params, we, can, we, we pass a parameter called, well, it's a dictionary with the key uh, called myparam, and that myparam is going to be injected in here, um, so you, you can access it from your Jinja template as params dot and the name of the, of the parameter, which is defined in that dictionary. Um, there are some additional macros that are available out of the box inside the Airflow. So for example, in here we have the macro called dsAdd, where we add seven day to execution date. 
you can also create your own macros, which you can refer to inside the Jinja template. On the left side in here, we have some um, parameters such as start date, which defines from which date this um, Airflow DAG should start running. Um, and we also define the schedule interval, so how frequently that should run. So in, in this case, we have a schedule interval of one day. Okay. So as you can see, everything is inside, everything is implemented inside Python, and then um, Airflow is uh, intelligent enough to, to basically parse this code, extract all the tasks uh, from it, and do the visualization, uh, showing what kind of tasks we have inside, and also showing the dependencies between these tasks. So in this case, we have uh, task T2 and T3 that are um, dependent on T1. So T1 is upstream from T2 and T3, which means that only once the T1 task will finish, then the, both T2 and T3 start, and they can run in parallel. So let's talk about some of the Airflow best practices that we use in, in Schemlinks. So a very, very important one that saved our life a few times, uh, I the pond and DAGs. So uh, it gives you, so if you implement your tasks in such a way that they're I dependent, um, you gain the possibility to, to rerun those tasks in the repeatable way. Um, to do it, you just need to make sure that the task is always cleaning after itself, um, doesn't leave any side effects, and you can basically rerun it safely twice and have the same result. Um, so if you don't do that, then you might have a problem because, for example, you know, the, the life happens and there will be some issues in your production system from time to time. And then if you will try to rerun a task in a production system, suddenly you will find that there were some um, side effects that you didn't, you didn't account for. So for example, you might have twice as much data or maybe you have three times more data because you run the same task three times and the task didn't clean after itself. Um, so it's very, very important because it allows you to rerun the tasks in a repeatable way. Tests. Um, so we did struggle a little bit with the creating good tests for our DAGs and the tasks. So the good news is that um, Airflow gives you like a quite easy way to test your tasks. There is a command line called Airflow test where you specify the name of your DAG, the ID of your task, and the date, and Airflow is going to execute that specific task. However, that wasn't enough really for us because we have some complex DAGs with uh, you know, many tasks inside them and then running manually and testing manually every single task wasn't, just wasn't cutting it because um, there's a lot of dependencies between those tasks. You want to make sure that you, you run them all in a correct order. So what we ended up doing is <clears throat> basically creating uh, a test DAG for every single DAG that um, runs exactly the same code as the DAG itself, and then uh, runs it on the input data, creates the uh, output data, and compares that output against the expected output. So pretty much a standard, what you would expect from the standard integration test. Um, we execute the integration test during each build, um, so basically if anything breaks, you, you will be notified by Jenkins or whichever building process you're using. Um, also, it's a very good idea to use separate environments for production, uh, staging, and the test uh, or local environment. So in our case, for the local environment, uh, we have a fully dockerized local solution. It's uh, very easy to do with the Airflow. And it, once you do it, uh, you essentially can run the local dockerized Airflow with a single line of code. So let's say that you have a new developer who wants to start and join your team. They can do it in three minutes because all they have to do is just download the Git repo and then start the local version of the Airflow with the Docker Compose app. In production, we are reusing the same Docker images and inside the Kubernetes cluster. 
So we have a, a horizontally scalable uh, workers with the seller executor. Very important thing is to make sure that you store your logs from your production cluster somewhere in the persistent uh, storage, so Amazon S3, HDFS, or Google Cloud Storage, because you workers will die from time to time. And when the worker dies and all the logs were on the worker, you are not going to know what happened, like what caused that problem. Um, ideally, if you can run a fully managed um, cluster, that, that, that's the best solution because then you don't have to worry about maintaining the cluster, upgrading the airflow, and, and so on. There are some commercial solutions that allow you to do it. Um, when it comes to deployment, you have few strategies. So there is a pool method, uh, so you can run the git sync on every single of your workers, UI, and the scheduler, and then pull the latest code from the master branch or production or the developer branch uh, if that's a staging cluster. Or you have a push model where you can push the code using something like rsync to every single of your workers. Alternatively, you can use the uh, persistent volume, so you can have all the workers in the read-only mode that read the data, read the latest Python code from, from a specific volume, and then you have a writable volume where you push all the latest code. Or you can just bake in your code inside the Docker containers. Um, the disadvantage in here is that um, whenever you are creating the new build, you will have to recreate the entire cluster. So you have to kill all the workers. You cannot really just push easily uh, the new code if, if that code is baked into the Docker containers. Um, whichever way, whichever solution you choose, Airflow gives you very good support for scanning the changes uh, in the latest files. So there is a setting in the Airflow um, that will scan, that allows, that defines basically how frequently Airflow should scan all the files for the latest changes. I believe by default it's uh, every few seconds, but you can, you can increase it to uh, every few minutes. And then Airflow will automatically pick up latest um, changes and uh, will run the latest version of your Airflow DAX. So to summarize some of the good, the bad, and the ugly that we found um, in Airflow during the last year, there are some issues as well with the Airflow. I mean, it's a relatively new open source project, um, so you know it's, it's expected. Um, one problem that we've seen is displaying the dynamically generated DAGs. Um, so because you create a DAG in the Python code, you can you know you can dynamically create the tasks. So you can, for example, create ten tasks today, but five tasks tomorrow. Um, if your number of tasks dynamically changes, that could be a bit tricky for the user interface to visualize, so just keep that in mind. Um, DAGs dependencies, in here you have a choice to either put all your logic inside some big and complex DAGs or split them into some smaller DAGs. Usually smaller DAGs is better, but then you have to somehow um, make sure that you connect um, you, you connect them within the airflow. So you need to let the airflow know that once this DAG finishes, the second DAG uh, can start. You do it with the, um, with the sensors. The problem with the sensors is that they're going to take your resources because the sensor is essentially a process that is waiting and checking some condition all the time. So like it, it can wait and check every few seconds whether this file already exists in the HDFS or not. So you know it's extra resource. Um, one problem that we are seeing in our current version of the Airflow is that the scheduler just stops scheduling things after a few days. So essentially, we, there is a setting in the Airflow that allows you to restart the scheduler. We restart it every few hours. Uh, it's not the case apparently in the latest version of the Airflow. So if you use the latest 1.10.3, that should not be the case anymore. Um, and then we also see some zombies problems from time to time. So basically the processes uh, just die, there is no heartbeat coming out of them, and then Airflow marks the process as a zombie, even though the, the process continues and works just fine. 
Uh, fortunately, it's not an issue because uh, we talked earlier about the retries, so Airflow will automatically try to retry that process, and, and usually if you implemented it in the either content way, meaning you know there is no side effects of rerunning it, it's, it's going to work fine. Then um, the last thing is the sub -dags. So there are some developers that uh, embrace them. We like to use them quite a lot, but there are some developers that really try to avoid them. Um, we like them because they allow us to encapsulate the complex code. So if you have a huge DAG with lots of tasks, you can group a lot of, of the tasks into a separate DAG, and you can include that separate ta DAG as a subtask in your existing, uh, in your existing uh, workflow. So to summarize, um, we managed to finish the migration from Hadoop to, to BigQuery. Uh, everything works great. Airflow has been a huge productivity enhancer for us. Like we believe that um, we are at least twice as productive using BigQuery and Airflow than we were with the Hadoop and, and Uzi. Um, so yeah, we are very happy, as you can see, at Scheme Links. And, um, Highly recommend it. Thanks very much. So I don't know if we have any time for questions, but uh, if um, if anyone has any question, just let me know. Uh huh. Go on. Uh, about the sub -ducks. So. Subduck, so essentially, uh, you, you remember when we talked about the operators, different type of operators, you have a basically DAG operator where you use another DAG as, as your task. So, so basically, uh, it, it just becomes um, similar to one of your tasks. You can drill in into such a, uh, such a task, and you can see like expansion of all the tasks that are within that other DAG. Well, um, we were reading a lot that their uh, scheduler is struggling with some of them because basically, you know, they will be scheduled on the same level. They'll, they'll be executed uh, as a single task. Uh, we didn't really see any problems with that, but uh, I was reading a lot about some issues. Yeah, no problem. Um, well, it depends how you schedule it, uh, how, how you set it up, but there shouldn't be any single point of failure. I think probably user, inter user interface might be a single point of failure, but a part of this, um, you, you, you can very easily do like multiple threads for the scheduler, you have uh, multiple workers, um, so it shouldn't be the case. Right. Sorry for taking extra time. Right, thank you very much. If, uh